Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 237 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This interview is the second of two in-depth tastings and conversations that I was lucky enough to grab at this year's Tales of the Cocktail Conference in New Orleans. And like our last tasting and chat with Fassbind Odevi, this interview with James Doherty of Sleeve League Distilling and the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey is also brought to you by our friends at Price Imports. And since this is the second consecutive brand-related interview brought to you by this organization, I figured it might be worth a brief second to explain who Price Imports are and what they do. Well, the family behind this family business, the father-daughter duo, I should say, are Henry and Nikki Price. Henry has been importing rare and fine spirits into the U.S. for over 40 years, and he recently teamed up with his daughter, Nikki, to take this latest iteration of their business to the next level. The great thing about this year's Tales of the Cocktail event is that Henry and Nikki brought a bunch of their brands in from places as far flung as Ireland, Switzerland, Brazil, and the Philippines to showcase their products to bartenders from all over. That, of course, is how I got the chance to interview Stefan Kopp from Fassbind last episode, and it's how I had the opportunity to interview James for this one. So a big thank you to Henry, Nikki, and the rest of the Price Imports team for setting me up with these fascinating people and products. But before we dive into this week's conversation, let's take a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Silky Special. To make it, you'll need two ounces of your favorite dram from the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey portfolio, and four to six ounces of your favorite local or premium quality cola. Quality is important here. In Donegal, Ireland, they use a rendition called Football Special that foams like a beer, giving it one of those nice rich heads that kind of sits there and provides texture as you sip. This is a built drink. So to make it, simply pour your whiskey dram into a chilled highball glass with plenty of ice, top up with the cola that you've chosen, garnish with a citrus twist, and maybe even a little squeeze of lemon, then give the glass a gentle stir and enjoy. On the face of it, the Silky Special is simply a Cuba Libre made with a very specific Irish whiskey, but I happen to think there's a bit more to this drink than meets the eye. Take, for example, the decision to use Football Special as the cola of choice. It's called this because it's made for kids to drink after their football matches when they go out to celebrate, allowing them a sort of non-alcoholic pub culture that mirrors the experience of the pints they see the adults in their lives enjoying. So in addition to the textural uniqueness of the soda, it also evokes a sense of home and memories of childhood friends for those who grew up in and around Donegal. This sense of home is something that James and I will focus on quite a bit in this conversation. Another thing to note about the Silky Special is that it takes a very deliberate stance on how one is supposed to enjoy this whiskey. In the world of single malt and premium grain whiskeys, much is made about the question of ice or water which glass to use, what premium cigar to light when enjoying a dram, but the Silky Special Cocktail suggests that maybe that's not the point of the legendary Silky. The point, it seems, is to enjoy it however you like, even, or perhaps especially, if that happens to be mixing it with the cola you enjoyed as a kid. So, now that you've got a new Cuba Libre riff to explore, and probably a craving for whatever soda you enjoyed during your childhood, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this delicious philosophical conversation with James Doherty of Sleeve League Distilling and the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey, some of the topics we discuss include 
The geography and culture of County Donegal in Ireland, located in the far northwest of the country, and how this elemental landscape inspires the spirits and the mission that James and his team undertake. Why James and his wife and distiller Moira consider themselves scatterlings, having come to Donegal after traveling and collecting flavors from around the world, and why this scatterling term informs their approach to creating spirits with a sense of time and place. Then, of course, we explore the legend of the Silky, a maritime yarn deposited in Ireland by the Vikings, and taste through the three primary expressions of the legendary Silky product line. We drink the flagship, the dark Silky, and the midnight Silky. Along the way, we cover why Irish whiskey is beginning to return to its smoky roots, in some cases, how building a blended whiskey can be like carving a block of marble, why Australians don't understand what the world truly loves about them, and much, much more. As you sink into this conversation filled with charming Irish legends and breathtaking landscapes, I'd encourage you not to be entirely seduced by them, but rather to pay attention to the ways in which James and his team are trying to advance the conversation about what Irish whiskey is and could be, and how they're grounding that mission in a place they truly love. That's a sense of place that's greater than the climate and weather conditions we generally consider when we think about terroir, and that's precisely the kind of thoughtful, integrated approach you'd expect from a brand that makes delicious exciting whiskeys. With that, I hope you enjoy this conversation and tasting with James Doherty of Sleeve League Distilling and the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. A real pleasure. So let's kick this off in our customary way. Uh, Would you please briefly just introduce yourself to our listeners? Who are you and what do you do? So my name is James Doherty. I'm the founder, one of the founders of the Sleeve League Distillers on the west coast of Ireland. We're bringing back smoky Irish whiskey and savory gins to the world. Mm, I like that. That's a, that's a beautiful ele- uh, elevator pitch, uh, <laughs> savory gins. Um, well, we've got some lovely whiskey in front of us, and uh, we're going to be tasting through one of your most exciting portfolios here, the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey. Um, But before we get to the liquid, I'm wondering if you might be sort of part tour guide, part cultural ambassador, and paint us a picture of County Donegal uh, for the vast majority of our listeners who probably have not been there. Absolutely. Including myself. Well, there you go. It's, it's, um, yeah, Donegal's an interesting place and and actually it shapes a lot of what we do. So um, my, my, you can tell from my accent that I'm not actually from Donegal. So um, I always thought I was Irish, as, as a lot of Americans would too. But um, my parents left Donegal in the 1960s and moved to England looking for work and, and opportunity and created it uh, and did very well for themselves. They've now retired back to Donegal now that we're back, um, which is very good. Donegal's a, it's a wild, raw, kind of elemental place. It's not chocolate box pretty. So it's not the... If you look at Wicklow, which is you know where everyone kind of pictures Ireland, so we, we have we have the rolling hills, but we are also battered by the wild Atlantic, and you know the sea is hard, and and that gives us a kind of inspiring kind of landscape to work with, and, and a sense of place that is slightly different to kind of cool Ireland, I guess. And so we, what we've kind of come at it from a perspective of um, actually before I go on, I should say Donegal is in the far northwest, so we're the most northerly county of Ireland. We're, we're actually on the western coast, um, as far west as you can go. Literally where the road stops is where we live. Um, and it's, it's, so it's geographically in the north, it's politically in the republic, and in the main it's probably forgotten by both sets of governments. So, mm. And that's kind of interesting because it leads a, a slightly sort of contrary approach to the world, which is kind of interesting. And so we've, we've kind of harnessed that in the way we come at it. I think I've inherited that from my parents. And and we kind of look at the business. We can, we talk about coming back to Donegal, where my grand, both my grandfathers were illicit distillers. 
um, to tell a story of that area and and to create opportunity so that people like you know my mum and you know and my dad's dad wouldn't have had to leave you know they, because distilleries are wonderful things as a business you know an international spirits business you know you know that in Scotland there are there are villages which have five, six, seven, eight distilleries, you know, like Dufton, and, and probably had no unemployment for, for sort of 150 years. And, mm-hmm. and a distillery on its own creates employment, but it, around it, you tend to create somewhere between eight and 10 jobs per job within the distillery. So we, th- we think it's a, a vehicle for creating opportunity for ourselves and for the area in a, in a very interesting way. And we try and celebrate Donegal, either the place and the kind of landscape, that wild elemental landscape, or the people or the culture or the language and so there's you probably i should have said to you you can try and count how many times you get the word donegal into the conversation but <laughs> that, that's the sort of start of it and then on top of that we kind of layer on the fact that both Moira and i love soft drinking hard spirits and maybe when we taste them a little bit later you'll see the softness in the mouth feel is it, mm-hmm. it allows you to carry big flavor big alcohol and that and and that's something we think is signature to us we try and make sure that um, everything's kind of beautiful because Donegal is beautiful. And I've painted a picture of wild, but it is beautiful in a kind of raw, elemental way. And we find that inspiring. And so we try and make things that are beautiful rather than necessarily pretty. Um, and, and, and then finally, we take kind of contrary positions. And, you know, the that there's a resilient people there that, that think differently about the world and and we think differently about spirits and so it's about trying to bring a distinctive take on Ireland and so I suppose Donegal first and Ireland second that's probably not a dime tour it's a bit long but it's it's a wonderful tour I have so, I have so <laughs> many things that I'd love to dig into uh, <clears throat> starting with with one of the things that you mentioned most recently this distinction between beautiful but not pretty uh, and and I, I love that because to me it speaks of symmetry versus uniqueness, you know, blending into a crowd as opposed to standing out from the crowd. You know, when you look at the map, which I would encourage anyone who's curious about spirits at the sense of place, I, I would encourage you to look at, at the map of Ireland and where County Donegal is located because it really does stick out as this finger of the Republic up into the the north the northern section there and uh it, it's it does make sense why you kind of say that you're kind of forgotten by both by both elements there yeah but getting back to the beauty versus prettiness uh you know one of my favorite quotes is that there is no great beauty that hath not some strangeness in proportion and great so point. you know so I, it, to me that really strikes a chord and you know pe- people might think you know beautiful versus pretty well, aren't those synonyms don't they mean roughly the same thing and i think what you're pulling out and hopefully what we will be able to pull out on our palates as we taste through some of these spirits is that slight yet very crucial distinction between those terms so you made reference to it before but i think one other aspect of the story behind sleeve league distilling and uh the legendary silky that i'd love to mine a little bit further so that our our listeners can understand how you're coming at this yeah. is the the notion of uh, a scatterling what is a scatterling and and why is that important to, yeah. this, to the story well a scatterling i suppose there are, there are a few things that, that kind of play into that and um, more and i refer to ourselves as scatterlings in that we you know more is from bulawayo and zimbabwe you know and she's a third generation Zimbabwean, but sort of scattered from her home to, you know, to, to South Africa, to Malawi, to the UK, now to Ireland. For me, you know, I think there was a quote in the film Belfast the other day, I was watching mm-hmm. on the plane on the way over, and they, you know, they said that, you know, the Irish are born to leave. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and there's something in that kind of mischief and melancholy of the area where the people leave. And, you know, my parents had to leave. So we're kind of, we're, we're, we are scatterlings in that, you know, home is probably where you're not. And, and I think you, when you're, when I was living with Moira and the two of us were living in Malawi, you know, we kind of talked about either going home to Zimbabwe or going home to England or whatever. But, and then when you got to England, everyone was saying to you, well, when are you going home to Malawi kind of thing or to Ireland or whatever. So, mm. so home is for us a kind of ethereal concept of kind of, of where you're not, but it, it's also <laughs> a, I think, you know, we look at ourselves as being you know, scattered and therefore slightly outsider-ish. And I, and I think that adds 
sort of a, almost a superpower. You know, I, I think it you know it could be a big hit handicap, but it actually, particularly for me, I think is a way of it gives you an ability to sort of see what's there as all of the people who are the other people who are there. But then you, because you have that slight outsiderish quality, you you are able to kind of cherry pick the bits that you think might resonate or that. Um, I often think about so a good right, parallel. If you forgive me, this a moment of indulgence is um, I worked for Foster's Beer in Australia for a mm. while, mm -hmm. and what's really interesting to me is what the world loves about Aussies isn't what Aussies think we love about them. <laughs> so there's a there's a piece about them which they 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 they, they we love their innocence, their go get them, their go get them, the lack of pretension, and we find that hugely engaging. And, and so, you know, Aussies get a friendly wherever they are because of it. But that's not what they think they are. And I think that's, ah. you know, so they don't see what what their real value to the world is. Interesting. And, and, I, and I think that ability to take yourself slightly outside things and then look back into them with, with a, an, an empathy and an emotional attachment, but also enough detachment to say, Okay, there's all of these stories, and there's too many stories. I think all is sort of rich with the illicit distilling heritage. It's rich with the sort of folklore, and it's picking the ones that you hope are going to resonate and and fit with your story and what you're trying to do. If yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, no, it makes complete sense, and I, I I love especially I think with the Silky collection, the storytelling there is is really important, and I think it's appropriate also that we're having this conversation here at Tales of the Cocktail. Before we started recording, you were just mentioning that you'd fallen in love with this city, yeah. and and we're we're here with all these. You know, uh, we were we were just downstairs uh, at, in the House Alpins and Price Imports uh, tasting room where there are all these people from Brazil and from all Philippines, uh, yeah. Philippines all of these yeah. different places, and they're all there, sort of pouring tastes of their home and their heritage. And so, I couldn't think of a better time for us to have this conversation. Before we get into the silky, because yes. I really want to give that story, that myth, yep. and then the, the the whole selection of flavors, the time that they deserve, could you just give us an overview of the Sleeve League portfolio? Because it's not just the legendary silky. No, it isn't. It's, it's. I mean, we're trying to build an international spirits business that 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 happens to be in Southwest Donegal, mm -hmm. um, and and use, and the portfolio is kind of tied together by looking at spirits from a sense of place yeah absolutely and that's kind of Donegal it could be the hills it could be the mountains it could be the sea it can so different angles of, of what Donegal is but also a sense of time so we try and place things in a sense of time so our gins come from uh, from the Spanish Armada so a time of savory drinks rather than sweet drinks and and the Silkies is a kind of return to Irish whiskey as it was perhaps in the 1920s and and, and before that and 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 builds on styles that would have been there with the illicit distilling of Donegal because Donegal probably has more of an illicit heritage. We make um, we make a vodka called Asaranka which celebrates uh, a, a waterfall close to us we, we, and in that waterfall grows gorse uh, which has beautiful yellow flowers that, that taste of coconut water mm -hmm. and it has rowan berries and, and they taste of sort of uh, apple-y sort of taste so we get this vodka that's botanically infused which is kind of kind of cool um, and we've got a few other ideas and we have our own whiskey distillery that you know it's a 500,000 litre 3,600 barrel whiskey distillery dedicated to peated Irish whiskies mm. we make nothing unpeated no no and we're not trying to make a patchwork of different styles it's singularly focused on on smoky and fundamentally based on an illicit distilling process that's been brought to life in a modern way. So um, so it's about character and Donegalness brought to life in various spirits categories. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time or money to do <laughs> some of the other ones. So we have a few other brands that are not developed yet, but they're, sure. the concepts are there. But, you know, the, one of the big challenges with what these kind of businesses is, is kind of doing a few things well and you know, just not running out of cash. <laughs> yeah, that that is the rub, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah, I, when I was uh, looking through your portfolio, I was really struck by the infused vodka, actually. Um, it reminded me very much, and it's so serendipitous that you mentioned that the berries and the sort of coconut water, gorse flowers, yeah. coalesce to uh, yield something of an apple flavor yeah. profile because 
just in concept, it reminds me of the WB Yeats poem, The Song of Wandering Angus. Uh, I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry yep. to a thread. And then he drops the berry in a stream so, and catches a stream and catches a little silver trout. And then later on, you know, there's references to apples. And so I was, just, I, I, I love that. And, and it's very pretty and also very local way to go about capturing those. And I think, you know, when I, when I look at a sort of fruity infused light botanical vodka yep. and then a savory gin and then we've got a smoky and intense you know in, intense in certain mm-hmm. ways uh, portfolio of whiskeys i think that that triad of flavor profiles yes. kind of complements one you know one uh-huh. complements the other nicely i think it's a nice sense of balance oh cool i, I hadn't considered it as that in a, in a triangle, the way you've described it, so it's quite interesting. But I think, yeah, we look for balance, and and, and we look for that. In you know, I, we're not we're not angry, so we you know we're not. I, I'm not I'm not a, an angry man trying to to shape. I, I am trying to shape the world to suit us, but but uh, it's 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 considered with thoughtful. You know, we we put a pin in the map where we live, and and we buy everything we can as close to that spot as possible, and um, and and do that and celebrate Donegal, its people, its language, its culture, the fact that we're in the Gaeltic, you know, an Irish speaking area and the Irish language is not not in the greatest of health, you know, it mm-hmm. needs and and we think that, you know, we use we intentionally use the Irish spelling. So Schlieb League spelled S S L I A B H intuitively doesn't come out as Schlieve, you know. No. Uh, but that you know, five years ago when we were starting out, you know, even the government bodies were saying to us, really, Irish spellings, you know, are you sure? And, you know, the world of gin is going kind of sweet and floral and f- frivolous and you're going rich and complex and, you know, are you sure? And we were kind of like, well, look, we, we don't have to appeal to everybody. You know, we, we just want a Donegal size prize. And I think that there's, in much the same way as Isla has a kind of bigger share of mind of scotch than it really has you know most people think all people all scotch is peated and it isn't and and that you know isla is this enormous place where actually it's what 15 percent of the total scotch category so it's not and actually it's probably 15 percent of single malt rather than of total scotch it, and if we could make an isla sized you know donegal to, to ireland what isla is to scotland that to me is a real sign of success that would be a real success and that mm. and it would mean that it's a lead on Donegal rather than a lead on Ireland, which isn't that I'm against the Irish thing in general. It's just that I can't see, I can't see how we can play. I mean, I think I kind of think about the business in because I'm a corporate, a world's corporate. It's kind of that where to play and how to win. So it's in that international spirits is the kind of where to play. The how to win is kind of Ireland, but then it's like how do you win within Ireland? And it's well, you have to be distinctive, which means you have to be. Donegal first and have strong sense of place, strong sense of time. And the time bit for me is useful as a way of building those brands, the brand world, so that you can pull them apart. Um, I, it, I think, you know, we, we could have called everything Sleeve League or Ardra and named the gin that, and they, but we, we kind of felt it was important that, that Dulaman had a, a world of its own. It's a maritime gin and the gin language is different and the, the sure. gin, the gin bar scene is different. Yeah. And the whiskey is kind of more, a bit more sober, if that's right. <laughs> um, a bit more serious, you <laughs> sure. know. Um, sure. You got those deep, those deep blues on the labels. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of, and so a lot of that's kind of come out of that is that how to, how to tell that story in an authentic and transparent way. And, you know, we share exactly where the whiskeys are from. If you go onto the website, you can see the recipes. There's mm-hmm. not, there's not a lot hidden. If you, if you put the lock code of the gin bottle in just like, say Waterford does, it'll bring out exactly where all the botanicals are from, who who distilled it on what day, how long it sat in tank, you can see all the pictures of the team bottling it. And that, I think that's important today as a table stake, you know, yeah. almost to, to do that piece of it. Absolutely. And, and it's great to see that you're doing it as a small brand as opposed to some of these larger brands that have, you know, more infrastructure to, you know, put to bear on, on those projects. Yeah. I, I 
really like the connection that you make between Isla and its impact and uh, I guess the gravity that it holds within the, the Scotch whiskey world. And, and I think it makes a lot of sense that that, that type of impact is something that you're striving for. Um, it, it, it's a rhyme or an echo that makes sense geographically, of course. Um, they have a, uh, I, I imagine that, uh, you know, the Northwest of Ireland and, you know, the, the Isla region have some similar characteristics when it comes to that maritime influence on not only the, you know, the botanicals, but also aid things like aging yep. and peat and, and all of this. So I'm wondering if you might pour us our first sample of the silky, just so that we can get it in the glass here we opening surely. up. So, uh, and, and while you do that, yep. I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to introduce us to, you know, the, the, the notion of a silky, which is, it's so funny because I was actually speaking with a friend not too long ago and she's, she, she asked, oh, you've heard about the seal people, right? We weren't talking about whiskey, but we were talking about, you know, Ireland and, and she goes, oh, you know, you, you know about the seal people, right? And I said, no, I don't know anything about the seal people. So can you tell us? what a silky is and why this became the icon or the you know a mascot makes it seem like somebody's dressing up in a in a fuzzy suit so, yeah. uh, but you know what why is this this legend the nucleus around which you started to tell the story of this whiskey so silky's a, a, a silky or a selkie in, in Irish, it's kind of interchangeable, but obviously silky is a nicer play on words from a, from a whiskey perspective. Um, <laughs> it, it is the mermaid legend, but it's told differently. So the, so the D Donegal, the word Donegal, comes from Dúnagal, which means fort of the stranger. And that's because it's not originally a Celtic, 100% uh, Celtic. It's actually mm. settled by Vikings. It's settled by the Pictish. Um, and it has a whole load of other influences that come on there. And interestingly, the, most of the mermaid legends that, that exist in the northern part of Europe come from Norse Viking legends. So, the, so they was brought to us by the Vikings. So they came down the west coast of Scotland and they brought Kelpies. And a, a Kelpie is the seal that drags you onto the shore and uh, onto the rocks and leads you to your doom, which is not so nice. And obviously an Irish <laughs> one is a little bit gentler. So the, the silky legend in, in Ireland is a, the silky comes ashore. She sheds her seal skin and it is a seal, uh, or she is a seal. And, and to dance on the shore, she sees a fisherman, she falls in love. There's a version of it that's told where she, he hides her seal skin that stops her going back to the sea, mm -hmm. which is a little bit, um, yeah, that's an abusive relationship, I think, yeah, these days. That, I don't think, uh, but actually, there's other ones where it's told where she, they fall in love and, and, and it's actually the, just the call of the sea becomes too strong and she goes back to the sea. And, and the way the fishermen locally would talk about it was that when the seals follow boats is because the silky is looking after her loved ones. So it's that legend. Every culture seems to have one. And for, for us, it was this kind of, could we build... They, they talk about all of the silkies being enchanting and, and beguiling. And so we're trying to work, well, can we bring that alive in a whiskey and, and use a Geltuck legend brought to life in a modern way? So that's really where it comes from. And if you think about lots of Irish whiskies, they, it's a cream label, it's got some fella's name on it, you know, so Doherty's, load of Victorian scroll work, fine aged, some other kind of suitable whiskey language on it. And we felt like we, if we were gonna do it, we should do pay homage to the kind of see the silky legend and strip back that stuff because it's we're not looking at sort of victorian pieces we're looking at kind of a piece of here and uh, when i say here i mean Donegal, but um and and trying to do that with a really paired back kind of labeling and kind of communication style we also needed it to be clear that we were sourcing the whiskey so we say that on the neck label and we probably needed the foot label to reassure you that it was a serious whiskey so it tells you some serious whiskey stuff now, <laughs> so, um, um well yeah it's it's uh nosing nosing the first bottle <clears throat> here the uh I, I guess what you would call your your flagship or your keystone product for the silky lineup what are we what are we looking at here so, in the glass so Legendary Silky, the original one, is a blend of 70% grain whiskey, 30% malt. Uh, the grain whiskey is in two components, so half and half rechar casks and half of it's in virgin oak casks. All mm -hmm. of the silkies are natural color, non-chill filter. And then to this we add double distilled single malt matured in sherry oak, 
So you get some sherry oak notes off it. Right. It's got some triple distilled single malt matured in uh, bourbon casks. Mm-hmm. So you've got those kind of light honeyed notes that you kind yeah. of would expect to get and that kind of freshness of sort of apple freshness of it. Um, and then it has 4% of the blend is peated matured in bourbon barrels. And what proof are we looking at here? So this is 46% ABV, so 92 proof. Mm-hmm. It's... Um, you shouldn't get anything on the outside of the tongue. There's a softness that goes down the center of the tongue. For me, mm. you get that softness, you get a kind of popcorn, buttered popcorn mm. kind of sweetness because we right, use a right. raised base grain whiskey. So that's where you get that kind of popcorny kind of character to it. Right. And sort of freshness of green apples. Yeah, it's, so, wonderf- it's wonderfully complex. If I were to blind taste this, I wouldn't necessarily think in the back of my mind, oh, this is someone's flagship product. This is someone's baseline. Uh, I would I would sort of assume that this was someone's sort of cask finished or, you know, uh, specially matured or specially, you know, specially treated in some way. And it, it doesn't taste like a baseline expression of anything. Okay. Gosh, that's very kind. It's um for us it we start with these kind of ideas and then and then kind of in, intuitively put the building blocks of the blend together mm. and then kind of refine it from there. The, 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 I was very lucky to sort of spend time with David Stewart, the Balvenie Malt Master, and so I've, I kind of did a rare whiskey stuff for Glenn and Fiddick and, and Balvenie and worked with him a lot. So I kind of know how to create balance in this. And so we, and, and, and Moira and I crank really good foils for each other in this. So we, we, when I'm pushing sort of a little bit too strong, Moira will come and push me back. And, and certainly you, you'll see that in Dark Silky um, a bit later. Mm. It's got a slight orange note to it. It does, yes. Yeah, citrus. And they, I mean, these whiskeys are sort of, you know, three to four years old. We're not looking at great age. And so part of the challenge is how can you use wood in a way that gives you this kind of complexity and riches and softness without having the access to access to age because that's just uh, you know the way irish whiskey is today it's challenging to find whiskies of the style that you want particularly as we want to get that peated bit in and so you know so for me it's this soft popcorn butterscotch uh green apples and then a hint of smoke when it warms up on your tongue so it's not almost not on the nose it's almost as it kind of creeps up on you See, I, to me, this is this is just a, uh, as much a pleasure to nose as it is. I'm glad we have these actually these big wine glasses because I can really kind of get in there yeah. and just almost almost dissolve into it as I close my eyes. It's uh, it has a lot going on, and um, and and I, I I think that you know generally when I hear someone tell me, oh well, there's smoke and there's fruit mm. and get and there's popcorn and then you taste the, the the grain and then you know this is this is peated or whatever when i have somebody list a catalog of influences and blend uh components that extensive yeah the flavor profile is almost inevitably muddy and yeah and they're and discordant and and mm. this to me is very harmonious it's very um you know all all of the different aspects that you've described are there but they're subtle and they're harmonious mm. and i think to me it th- those those two descriptors subtle and harmonious would be the way that i describe this to somebody who were asking me you know what's this like yeah gosh that, yeah i think um so integrated is really important to me mm-hmm. it's getting those flavors integrated because i think it, it there was so 2019 when we when we relaunched silky with this sort of very overt sort of peated structure to it we had we had a hint of um there was a hint more citrus to it but there was always one spike you know, so just there was one spike that just wasn't quite integrated, and and we we actually changed the shape of the grain whiskies at that point to to try and mask that citrus spike and pull it back in, and 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 that's what you have now. So we we put we actually increased the level of virgin oak in it, which the the sort of esters we were getting out of the rechar was just kind of giving us some weird stuff. We upped the the virgin oak. That gate that mar- sort of put the balance back into there, but actually virgin oak is that much more powerful, and then knocked the peat down. So we had to go from two percent peated to four percent peated to get the smoke back in into the finish. So, um, so it's, they're as good as we can make them today, and we'll always kind of try and keep them. I mean, we, one of the reasons keep the, so keep that kind of consistency because one of the reasons we haven't kind of splattered small batch and things like that over here is is I don't want 
I don't want the luxury of that safety net of saying, well, look, each batch might be slightly different. Uh -huh. You know, they, we, we used to blend in batches of sort of 10 casks at a time. Now it's 20, you know, casks at a time. So each batch is sort of 3,000, was 3,000 bottles, is now up to about 6,000 bottles at a time. So it's important for me that, that this is consistent all the time. And that's, and that's an ongoing kind of challenge. I love how you describe the citrus element that you found problematic as a spike. And then, you know, I'm almost picturing you as someone, you know, trying to chisel down something, you know, a woodworker or a stoneworker chipping, chipping down on, on a, on a, uh, an aspect of, you know, the, the marble in front of you, that's not, not helping the, the end sculpture to, to do what you want it to. And then when you knock that block off, suddenly it becomes a little bit unbalanced in another right. way. And so then you have to go and adjust the peated from two, 2% to 4%. I think those, that visual, uh, that visual metaphor is really helpful for people who appreciate the flavor profile of a good whiskey, but don't necessarily understand the art and science that go into it because knowing the difference between 2% and 4% peated or knowing yep. the difference between rechar and virgin oak, oak is very much a science. Like you have to understand the cause and effect of these different decisions on the end spirit and that's all science and yet the act of knocking off a spike sort of, and then rebalancing something that suddenly comes out of balance when you do that that's art yeah and uh, to me that that visual metaphor is really helpful um so it's so, it's interesting as well it kind of was winning gold medals before we knocked the spike off to use your, to use your <laughs> phrase um but it always annoyed me it was kind of like everyone was going oh, it's lovely it's lovely it's lovely and i was kind of going yeah. Yeah, it's lovely ish. You know, it's just ish. <laughs> there was an ish, and I and I wanted to get rid of the ish. So, so we um, and I think the beauty was that we made the change, and no one picked it. So no one came back and said, "Oh, it's you know, you've done something," uh -huh. and and so that was kind of fun. The fact that we'd done that, but what you could see then was when it went into competition and it was judged. Suddenly, you know, Silky then won best blended Irish, twenty twenty one at the World Whiskey Awards, and you kind of go, "Okay, yeah." So. It is significant because it wasn't getting that before. So someone, you know, guys with good palates who know are picking it now. Yeah. And, that, and so that was that was the bit where you kind of went, okay, I'll take that. Right, <laughs> so. right. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're a regular listener of the Modern Bar Cart podcast, you've heard me talk about Near Country quite a bit over the last year. And... I have another exciting announcement. They've got cheese, guys. Not only do Adam and his team work with a bunch of awesome local farmers and fishermen here in the Mid-Atlantic to provide you with sustainably raised and delicious proteins, but they've upped the ante yet again, and they now offer delicious cheeses, cow's milk and sheep's milk cheeses, that you can subscribe to on a monthly basis, or you can just go ahead and add them to your cart as an add-on at any point. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, all one word at checkout. Becoming a Near Country Provisions subscriber is easily one of the biggest quality of life improvements I've made in the last year or two, so I hope you'll give Near Country Provisions a shot and let me know what you think. Now, back to the show. So mm. now that we've basically acquainted ourselves yep. with, with, the, with the baseline, the, the original legendary Silky, yeah. um, what should we taste next? So we should go on to Dark Silky next. And... Um, and what, and what we're trying to do with these is obviously our distillery and our dry is, is, is years away from producing, is from, from releasing. So what we're trying to do is two things. One, we're trying to build out the idea that a, that smoky Irish whiskey is a, is a thing, you know, mm -hmm. that people can buy it. And it's a, it's a genuine, um, it's a proper reflection of what would have been here in a few years, you know, a few years past, but also um, build out a, a sort of platform that when these whiskies come to market, we're in a place where people kind of go, oh, I get that. And I know what I'm kind of, I can expect from that in the future. So we've gone on a journey of smoke. So, so if you think about Silky at original at 4%, mm -hmm. it's a hint of smoke. 
It's very subtle. It's there, and it almost says, please, can we do smoky Irish? And let's give us permission. So it's, it's sure. still within the category. And so when it wins awards, we kind of look at it and go, it should win awards. It's, I think it's a good blend. It's well done. Mm-hmm. It's, and it, it's, whereas Dark Silky now is kind of taking you on a journey where, to where I suppose I'm where I want the world to be. And right. da- so Dark Silky ups this now. So there's 15% of this is uh, peated, triple distilled single malt, Irish single malt in a, in a bourbon cask. 15% of it is uh, double distilled single malt and sherry casks. And 70% of this now, interestingly, is virgin oak grain whiskey. So th- they're not brothers, they're cousins. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was going to say they, they nose completely differently. They do. And and so the idea is that they're, they're kind of showing you... In a way, we don't almost we don't have two hundred years of history to, to to sort of sell you. I can't tell you that, but I can show you from the, the gins we make, from the blending we do, that we're technically good at what we you know we know we had we know what we want intuitively. We can design it, we can make it, and we can do it consistently, uh, and and hopefully that reassures people about the quality of what we do. Sure, yeah. To me, it noses almost like a, a hybrid. If we're if we're talking Scotch, it it noses somewhere between a hybrid Highland Isla, uh, you know, kind of. It's you've got some. Some some say slightly saline qualities on the nose. Uh, some yeah. Some so that, that, sl- some slight uh, slight uh, and a good bit of smokiness. But you know, it's it's definitely not one or the other. It, it's it you, you know by mentioning that it's not a, a, a sibling, it's rather a cousin to the original a legendary so, silky. I think is a perfect way to describe the relationship. And what we've tried to do as well is is I think it, it, so. The inspiration was. If you can imagine eleven-year-old me running around my grand's house like a feral child in Ireland <laughs> on holiday, and we used to get down early in the morning, we used to take Grandad's pipe, and we used to run around the kitchen, sort of tugging on his pipe like we were the men of the house. And for me, this is a, it's a visceral. You can see I can get goosebumps. Uh, visceral memory of kind of that sweet tobacco, ashy mm. kind of aroma, and and for me, that's the taste that smoky Irish whiskeys should have. It's that. It's it's not specific in the way that some of the islands are. It's not. It's more generic. It's more general, and it's a flavour that we can then use to overlay here. And I think in this blend now you get, for me, that softness is still there. It's actually the bridge I see slightly different to yours. Is that it's like I see a bridge between kind of Ireland 1900 and the New World mm. in terms mm-hmm. of style because that virgin grain is somewhat like a sort of you know bourbonish in style, if you like. So I get that softness. And now that sort of butterscotch sweetness is kind of tempered down and it's now much more sort of salted caramelly and and sort of baked apples and the smoke is now kind of quite overt ashy campfire like aroma so there's not a no medicinal no there's no tcp right. it's that dry mm-hmm. ashy pipe tobacco totally i love the pipe tobacco connection because you know on the nose, they're very, very different. But then on the palate, you get you get those those the the sweetness is really a bridge to me between these two. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think that to me is what does make this a distinctly mm-hmm. Irish whiskey. In that, you know, yes, we've got some some peat in there. Yes, we've got some smoke and some. Uh, y- yes, we're right by the the brutal North Atlantic mm-hmm. with all that that implies. Yeah. And yet, this is still very distinctly an Irish whiskey. And I'm grateful you say that because I think it's important for us that it is sit, um, it, uh, it sits in the category. It sits on the edge of the category, mm-hmm. but it's it's still very much Irish. And I, I, you know, one of the things that they're both blended probably to be a little bit sweeter than most would like. But we, I mean, perfect in New Orleans because we drink. With, you know, we drink with ice. Maury and I would drink with ice all the time. So you know, you live in Africa, you learn to drink <laughs> tall, tall glass, lots of ice. You know, and sure. I want it cold. I don't want it diluted. I want it cold. And and so, you know, the, what's interesting, particularly I think with with um, dark silky, is that if you put ice in, uh, and unfortunately we don't have one right now, but if we put some ice in it, the 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 mid, the, the smoke becomes incredibly earthy mm. and it's really nice, really flexible, and so it lends itself to kind of cocktails in a really clever way. Um, so you know, it kind of takes takes you into a place that's more challenging than where the original one takes you to. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do appreciate the, the cocktail reference because that was one thing that I was a bit curious about coming into this. Um, you know, generally when you see someone 
with a whiskey project as serious mm. as this one, not as serious necessarily in tone, but as serious in like ambition. Mm -hmm. uh, like yeah. you're, you're truly trying to advance a conversation about Irish whiskey. I tend to find that people don't want to talk about mixing with mm -hmm. these spirits. So uh, how do you think about, I mean, I, I'm sure that with, I'm sure Moira could talk to us about mixing with the gin Gins, and yeah, the yeah. vodka, which is <clears throat> just must be wonderful. And it's also an obvious place where those spirits are going to shine. How do you think about mixing with this the legendary Silky? So I, so I'm not proud at, at all, you know? So for me, I, I think what, what we should do is make it, uh, the whiskeys as good as we can make them. And then for me, I have, how you enjoy it is completely up to you. Cause I, you know, I take other people's drinks and I enjoy them the way I enjoy them and that's <laughs> it and all about it. And so, you know, um, and if you look at Twitter, you know, I do tastings and stuff in, in during lockdown and the number of people is like, you know, well, what are you doing? You know, what, what next? So we did a deconstructed tasting of these things with all the different components and, and I'm going, put some ice in it. And the guy's going, no, 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 no. You know, and I'm going, look, ice, if I'm, if I'm test, if I'm tasting and I'm writing tasting notes, I'll put a bit of water in, open it up, spend some time for pleasure. It's, it's ice, put it sure. in, try it. And the, and the number of people kind of go, had started like a little hashtag and it was James made me do it. And, <laughs> and it was kind of good fun because then people started to play with it. And we, there's a local, uh, there's a local soft drink, a local soda with us in Donegal called Football Special. And Football Special, every regional bottler had a Coke variant. Yeah? Sure. And they, and so football, McDade's had theirs and it was called Football Special and it foams like a beer and it was for kids to celebrate after football matches. Nice. And it's incredible. So there's a there's a drink that, that the Saturday night sip crowd on Twitter have, which is which is a silky special. And it's either a silky or a dark silky. I prefer it with dark silky and football special and loads of ice. So, you know, so there's simple things like that. For me, the, the smokier ones lend themselves to old fashions just because that smoke is a kind of lifts and elevates things. I, for, for me, I, I, I've had a few since I've been here and they've all been good, but I, I'd like a little bit more citrus because I think that that orange note that's in here, you can play with it right? and you can extend that quite nicely. And and I really, as long as you enjoy it and come back for another one, I don't mind. <laughs> so. I think that's the right that's the right mindset to have going into the cocktail project, um, especially with a whiskey. You know, people, people tend to uh, be a little bit more free spirited with clear spirits, but with whiskeys, yep. people get a little bit too serious, perhaps overly serious. And uh, I think it's I think it's a almost a responsibility that people like you and I have to remind them that at the end of the day, these are silly, fun drinks. It, it's, it's you know, it's it's, hospi it's hospitality yeah. and it's inclusive. So bring people in, let them enjoy it. I mean, as you say, Moira's probably more flexible. She, her favorite drink would be uh, her Andaluman gin as a mojito. That's oh, kind yeah. of offbeat, you know, oh, but yeah. a maritime mojito made with gin is, so it works really well. And and so, you know, we do, we play and, and we, we enjoy and we celebrate them for what they are. And, you know, I think we shouldn't get too hung up about it. And you know what, the, the other thing is that the, when, you, when you look at sort of the bartender scene, the mixologists, the guys that can really do it, they're so much better than me. So what, <laughs> I ain't gonna tell them what to do, you know, just try it, see the flavors in it, and then play with it yourself. And in Dark Silk, you know, it's worth maybe mentioning that it got, it was best in show at San Francisco last year, 2021, and it won the Chairman's Award, I think at Ascot as well. So, and that's, I think for me, that's significant because it's an outlier, you know, from a taste perspective, this is not where Irish whiskey is today. And for it to win those kind of awards is recognition of the quality of what's in it. But it's also probably recognizes that there's a, an openness to, you know, the moment you're going through a phase in Irish whiskey, which is kind of wood led and everyone's sort of finishing and doing interesting things. And actually I've got a red silky here, that just a sneak peek, but there's, you know, we're gonna we're going over the next five or ten years, gonna enter into a kind of a spirit led space, which will show the depth and diversity of what people are doing, and, and kind of people are going back into history, just like us. You know, going back into history to find old recipes and bring them forward and, and reinterpret them in a modern context, and, and that is going to be fascinating to see how that develops. There's two really important things that you noted about the San Francisco Spirits Competition win there, and one is that when you win an award like that, it is necessarily category driven. Yes. You know, it, it, you, you win in your category and a category has a definition, yeah. whether it's a 
sort of implied soft definition or an actual written definition. And these, you know, the people who organize these judging events split these spirits up into categories based on that category. And so to have something that is intentionally pushing the boundaries of that category, take best of category, that's like throwing a dart at the dartboard and having one that hits, you know, outside of the rings, you know, declared the bullseye or something yeah. like that. Kind of, maybe not that extreme. Mm. But then on the other hand, the other thing that you pointed out is that these judges tend to be on the cutting edge. They tend to be very yeah. familiar with these trends. And so that openness to saying of like, why shouldn't this be where the Irish whiskey category is heading? Yeah. It's, it's kind of a conversation that you as the producer are having with other people who are deeply invested in this style of spirit. And I like that, that I like that conversation because it's sort of implied. It's like, okay, you know, yeah. you, it's a, it's an inductive conversation. You throw something out to the world, you put out your little beam of sonar and then something comes back to you. Yeah. And in this case, what came back to you was a validation of the project. Yes. So knowing that that's kind of where we stand with the legendary dark silky. Yeah. We have something that may be even more intense and a little bit more pushing of that boundary. Absolutely. So we got the midnight silky now. So um, this is a. Um, so we're taking it on a, a, another degree. So this is now thirty-five percent of this blend is now peated single triple distilled peated Irish. But what you've got in here is um, it's now a, because they're cousins. All of them are still cousins and sure. not brothers. This is now a single malt. Now we haven't put single malt on here, so it says so it's a blend of single malts but they are actually from one distillery so they're sure. all from great northern so so you could put single malt on here my belief is that if you put single malt on a bottle everyone assumes it's from your distillery and mm -hmm. so sure to avoid that kind of consu consumer consumer confusion so we we still say it's a blend because it's just easier for us to hold on to that <clears throat> And it's so different, in, again, in structure, because you've now lost the grain. Right. And right. the grain kind of gives you that big round belly of sweetness to hang things on. And, yeah. uh, and it kind of uh, plays a tune that, that's actually quite straightforward to hang off. Whereas with the single malts, particularly when they're kind of younger ones, you don't have that luxury. So now 35% um, of it is a peated single, peated single malt, and that's kind of gives you all of the smoke on the nose that you want. Um, the the structure, if you like, of this one oh. is a triple distilled unpeated in Cabernet Sauvignon casks, mm -hmm. which are kind of toffee apple sweetness, and an imperial stout casks, um, which gives you this, I thought it would give us a chocolate note. It doesn't really give us a chocolate note, it gives more of a sort of creamy texture. And that allows us then to put some Oloroso sherry uh, casks in there and then some Oloroso sherry that we finished in virgin oak to give us a little bit more bitterness because it got very sweet and we wanted the bitterness to come into it. Sure. I, I like the distinction that you drew earlier when you were talking about the sort of elimination of the grain. Yeah. Because I think that to me is uh, a little clue to me about where some of the texture in this product is coming from it's very very different texturally than the other two yeah it's it's much chewier and uh it's you know it, it almost reminds me a little bit more in flavor profile to the original legendary yeah. silky um and so but but knowing that you had to get there through a very different series so, of decisions and 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 blending techniques is kind of fascinating and it's been uh, if i'm honest it's been, it's been the most challenging one to do and and partly because we 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 got it straight out of the gun you know straight out of the gate we got this flavor right and then we said <laughs> and i sent out the samples all to the board just to say this is where we're going to go are you happy with this um this you know we believe this is the right direction and and lost a piece of paper with the recipe on it. Oh no. no. So we had to go back to Great Northern and say, well, look, this is what we wrote. We think this is what we wrote down. And then Brian said, well, actually that's not what I wrote down. And then we put them two together and we're like, actually this doesn't taste at all. Like oh, we no. thought, And so we, we were almost back to sort of ground zero, um, but kind of intuitively it was like, well, let's start with the picture we had of this, which was this kind of fruity, smoky, almost Christmas-like. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So you got this, 
<clears throat> so now you, you, you've got this kind of toffee apple sweetness and then you go, you've got sort of nutmeg and cinnamon and kind of cloves and stuff like that coming in. And, and then the sort of smoke is then gently laid over. And when we went back to the first principles, we kind of came forward quite quickly again. So yeah. it was, but it was frustrating because we, we just would not, you know, Brian and uh, you know, Great Northern and ourselves were just you know, on different song sheets and it wasn't working. So we, we just went down and hit the beauty about Great Northern and the flexibility that they've got is also that you know, Brian and I worked together at Glenfiddich and oh, sorry, Grants years ago. So he's really good about just saying, there's the lab, huh. everything's out. And then, you know, I, I get to play and, and then he'll come back sort of two or three hours later and say, so where are we? And we kind of go, look, I'm, I'm here, but I think we need to do this. And he's going to, you know, he'll have a taste and more and have a taste. And we kind of go, okay. And we'll circle the pinhead and then we land. So, so, yeah. so it's kind of good fun. Um, I, I imagine that, I mean, you know, we're, we're picturing a lab and uh, ostensibly it is a lab. It's a laboratory space. And yet there's a, a grown man playing with whiskey in it. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's also, you've got all these bottles and there's this color there's, and there's aroma. Obviously your palate gets tired, sure. but there's also, sure. for me, it's almost like you, there's a paralysis of choice and you try to get rid of choice as much as, as so you, you kind of go intuitively, I think this is the building blocks and then you kind of finesse but you're trying to get stuff off the table mm -hmm. rather than bring too much onto the table. Sure. Um, I'm not good enough. It's that process to, of knocking the spikes off, knocking, yeah. knocking things off. Just of, as you say, chipping away yeah. to, to, you know, like I know that this, I know there's a knee in here. I've just got to sure. find it. Kind sure. Of um, uh, well, I think we're at the point in the conversation now where we've we've got a we've got a really interesting sense of the project that you're doing here with the legendary Silky. We we've got what the portfolio looks like today. Yep. And I think the next logical question as we wrap up our conversation here is what does the future look like for James, for Moira, for yep. the Silky and for Sleeve League in general? Well, we've got um so we've got a red silky coming. So we did a red silky a few years ago and sold out in absolutely no time at all. So that's come back by popular demand. It, it tells the story of Red Hugh, the last chieftain of Donegal, who lost at the Battle of Kinsale and then sailed to Spain to raise an army with King Philip. And he met King Philip in Rioja. So we used some Rioja barrels. Mm. And he stayed with the monks at Simancas. And uh, so we use Ribera del Duero casks from that. So you get the sweetness of the Rioja and you get the dryness of the Ribera. And we put those together and we've got a little sample of that here. So that'll be here. I think we're shipping it just before Christmas time, but it'll come out sort of January, February mm -hmm. in, here in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll be a little bit ahead of that in Europe because we, we got the stuff in a cask earlier and over, over that. And we'll do some more of that. I've got a few, a few of those kind of Donegal legends that we're going to bring alive again. It, you know that tell the story using some cards finishes which i think we need to do for silky we've um we've just raised, raised 1.8 million euros in uh um on crowdcube so um to invest in the distillery which will take it from a, a capacity to do two shifts at the moment we've got a, we've got sufficient sort of fermenters to do two shift production which is sort of 500,000 liters 3,600 barrels to take that up to 5,000 barrels um and run it 24 seven. And I think we've kind of proven the concept to the point where we kind of, get, we know that it's gonna, that the smoky Irish idea is gonna work. And the worst thing we can do is not have enough stock. <laughs> so so we need to sort of plan for that. Um, on the gin front, Moira has been uh, working on two, two new expressions. Um, one which will come out sort of October time, which celebrates our time in Asia. So mm -hmm. the uh, Dillaman mm -hmm. Gin kind of briefly just it captures the magic of the sea. It's 11 botanicals, five of them seaweeds. Um, they all have a natural sort of sweetness, which is really interesting, but they they also gives you this kind of saline, savory quality. And we use Irish moss or carrageen moss in, as vapor infused to get this really kind of interesting silky texture to it. Makes an incredible martini, but she's exploring her time in Asia. So we're using, a, so there'll be a Memories of Asia release. Um, and she's also working on one that looks at, she, you know, she was brought child of Africa. So they'll, all of those African tastes and bringing that to life. So that's going to be fun too. Seems um, like an exercise in botanical sourcing. Yeah. And that's a, that's a challenge. And, it is. and, um, it's, and it's also a challenge because you have to distill all these things individually and learn about them and understand what works well and then which ones combine, you know, with, with her seaweed gin, um, Gosh, there were 42 seaweeds we started with, 22 we decided actually tasted interesting. 
and then five we settled on, but we, we distilled them all f dried, fresh, frozen. We used ultrasound. We did all sorts of things. Yeah, so uh -huh. it's, it's an exercise in um, discipline, I think. And then with, with our dry, um, it's an interesting distillery from a, I think it's interesting and, and perhaps important, if it's not a bit pretentious, but it, which is, you know, it, it's bringing a style back. Um, Donegal doesn't have a history of sort of legitimate distillery. It has, a, it has a, an illicit history. So in 1815, there were five times as many illicit distillers in Donegal as any other county, county in the whole of Ireland. And we've taken a, the, an illicit distillers process and brought it back to life. Um, so it's grains in, and we get all of the access to all of the all of the husk, all of the flavour in the husk, and everything. But but actually, by hammer milling, we've actually also got access to increased sweetness as well. So, mm -hmm. and we've got long ferments, so it's kind of fruity. So, you know, if the Irish category is sort of sweet and smooth and easy, I, and that's a modern tradition rather than a lot an old tradition, all of us going back to that old tradition is going to come forward. Yeah, you know, whether it's Peter Moore Ryan down at Blackwater or the guys at Killowen or we're all doing different things that look back to come forward. Ours, I think, is significant because it resurrects that style that would have been there. So it's, you know, super, super soft, rich, smoky, um, challenging, but not... I Ireland's an approachable place, so it's not challenging as in, it's not optimal challenging. Sure, it's, sure. It's, cha it's challenging in, in a sense that, gosh, I didn't expect that. Yeah. Uh, and I think if we can do that, then then I think we we set the Irish category up. You know, we, we add an interesting bow to the string to the bow of that Irish category. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think this brings us full circle and, you know, it, it, it reminds me of, you know, where we started this conversation. You mentioned that the Irish were born to leave and when one leaves, one eventually finds a way to return home, you know, that that concept that was also important to you. So it seems like this next phase that you're describing with the the new facility and the, um, you know, the focus on bringing back that you know, exploring what it meant to distill illicitly, yeah. but now doing it in a legitimate and, you know, at scale format. I think that's that's you kind of returning home and, you know, exploring what, what it can look like today yeah. now for you. So I think to me that that really f feels nice. It, it, it does. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting how you set out on this journey and you kind of have a, you know, I wrote a presentation with Moira in, you know, 20... 2013, 2014, before we resigned from our jobs in Hong Kong and came back, and and the the, the ultimate vision is still is is almost exactly the same. You know, some of the details change within it, but what's interesting is not the. It's kind of like you build a distillery and people look at the distillery and they go, "Wow, you know, you must be so proud." And actually, the bit that you get most pride out of is is all the all of the difficult stuff you've had to solve on the way through and how you've managed to build it on a shoestring and. Um, and, and the kind of help and support that you've got from people, the, the journey is so much more important right. than than that the end game. And actually, when you, what you realise is as you get to that end point, that's actually just the beginning of the next bit. It's not sure. an end point at all. Sure. So um, yeah, it's been a, an incredibly enriching experience. Well, James, this has been tremendous. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you being such a, a willing and enthusiastic guide through not just the liquid in the bottles, but also the the mindset and the processes responsible for that liquid. For our listeners, uh, whether they're here in the U.S. or abroad, what's the what's the best way that they can connect with you digitally? And most mm -hmm. importantly, what's the best way they can get their hands on a bottle of either the legendary Silky or the beautiful gins and the infused vodka that, that you produce? So sadly, the infused gins and, and vodka's not here yet. So um, so we're working with Henry at the moment at Price Imports, uh, and we'll we'll get it over here shortly. So that'll that, yeah, watch this space, watch the socials. Uh, www.sleeveleagdistillers.com spelt the Irish way yep. S-L-I-A-B-H L-I-A-G <laughs> we'll, or, or spelt modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast and we'll link to it on the show notes page so you Perfect. don't have to worry about the spelling <laughs> good man thank you um, and then all of our socials are, are brand specific so you have Silky Whiskey Doolam and Gin um, we've been really lucky I mean we've gone I think we're out in, in I think we've got agreements in 50 states of America we're not live in 50 states yet so we're pretty much out there getting there. Henry's done an amazing job for us in, in getting the brands out there, including in the, I guess, I think you call them the flyover states here. So we've, <laughs> we've spent some time in 
kind of even Butte, Montana, biggest Donegal population outside Donegal. Nice. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, so it's really interesting that outside of the kind of whiskey heartlands, the Irish whiskey heartlands that you'd expect us to, to be in, you know, to, to see kind of Memphis, New Orleans, kind of places like that really kind of special so yeah we'll be hopefully we'll be in sort of liquor stores near you in in not too distant future and um yeah hope you enjoy them and get a, don't forget that a little bit of air at the top is pure donegal we'll give you that for free <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well i can't think of a better way to wrap this up so james i just want to thank you once again for being a guest here on the modern bar cart podcast thank you so much for having me really appreciate it Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, Irish Whiskey Insights courtesy of James Doherty of Sleeve League Distilling and the legendary Silky Irish Whiskey, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2022.